Result. The wake-up call, yeah. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. If you're online with us this morning, we uh, welcome you. We thank you for joining us today, and uh, uh, we're happy that you're here with us. Uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. So we get a little break maybe today from the humidity and... Uh, Get a little cooler weather coming in. It's going to seem more like fall. Today is the uh, autumn equinox, so we have the first day of fall starting up here. So i uh, like to see a little more rain here, get a little more moisture in there. We were in there cleaning out all the flower beds and everything yesterday, and uh, we got to do a lot better job of watering next year. Uh, <laughs> so um, we are... Continue on this week uh, with our series on The Chosen, Season 4. So this is Episode 2 that we're starting today. So this Wednesday, we will be showing that episode in Season 4 at 7 o'clock p.m. So you're all invited to come back for that one as well. And then following up with that, we're going to have our men's breakfast coming up October. We're going to leap into October now. October 5th, then we'll have our men's breakfast here. And uh, we have some really different things planned in here. Um, and so. And some old things. Yep, well, that's true, Denny. You can be here. Uh, oh, you, you meant the menu items. Uh, okay. Yes, we will have biscuits and gravy and uh, have what counts in here. And then uh, the following week, then, on the 12th, we will have our orange track racing. Uh, so we convert all this into our racetrack in here, and we'll have our orange track racing going on. Uh, the prelude to being blue track racing. So uh, my grandson and I came out here yesterday, and, and I grabbed uh, one of our demo sets of, of our blue track, and we laid it out, and we were testing some different things with different cars, and ending up spending several hours playing with uh, Hot Wheels cars, so that was fun. Um, but he really enjoyed it. I had a good time and learned some things on the track. That is fast track, I gotta say that much. So I'm really looking forward to then this next season, which is hard to believe that's gonna be year 20 for orange track racing. So it's awesome, awesome. And again, that's gonna be October 12th. And if you'd like to check it out, orangetrack.org. <clears throat> so then coming up in November here, we're gonna be showing the movie, The Nativity Story. Uh, so as we convert this place into our movie theater in here with our big screen and everything, uh, we'll have that. And this is the nativity story that speaks from the position of Mary. And so it's a little bit different from probably what we've experienced in the past, uh, but it's an excellent, excellent story. And obviously uh, that is the lead in then with the birth of the Son of God and his ministry here on earth. Uh, so we look forward to that. So that should be fun. Um, I'm thinking we may be doing that possibly on November 2nd. So mark your calendars with a possible check mark for there. Uh, I think that's probably when we're going to have that in November. Uh, then today's worship, we're going to have a message in here. And Pastor Terry and Diane are on a weekend of R&R this weekend. So uh, we have our new tech crew in the back back there having a good time. And so... Uh, Doug will be posting up our message this week as well as our music for those of you who are online uh, to go ahead and click on that and enjoy it. Um, I had like 10 songs that I kind of <laughs> previewed and no, I didn't put all 10 in. I was, I was kind of, maybe I'll just skip my message one of these. We'll just do music the whole time. I'd love that. Um, so please uh, review that, that music and the message today. Uh, and then we can uh, go to God in prayer as we start this time of worship. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you for being here in the room with us. We thank you for giving us this opportunity to gather here together in your name and to be able to bring praise, honor, and glory to you. With our presence here this morning, with our praise and our worship time, our prayers and lifting up people and edifying them in your name today so that no matter what struggles they're taking on, healing that they need, grief that they're overcoming. Lord, you're there and you're present in their lives, and we just praise you and thank you for the opportunity to invite you into their situation by praying for them. 
Lord, as we come into our time of worship today, we ask that you would open our ears to hear and our, our hearts to receive your message in and so that we can live it out each and every day. And we pray all these things in your precious name. Amen. Well, the call to worship this morning uh, comes from Isaiah 43, verse 1. And for many of you, you probably know this one here. Some of us have it memorized somewhat. But do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. When you go through deep waters and great trouble, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Wow. What a powerful message. What a powerful message. I remember in, in my journey as I was going through my Christian walk early on, uh, this was a, I, I was a DJ at KRNA and I was there to announce a concert that was just starting. And uh, you know, somebody walked up to me and handed me a Bible when I came down off the stage. I, I announced the group and and they handed me a Bible and said, God wants to talk to you. I opened up the Bible, and that's the verse. It just leapt off the page at me. So God the Father is calling out. God the sovereign creator acts for special people that he created with the love of a father. God's love is the only reason God's people can ever experience salvation. It's because of his love and his grace that he gives us, that we can have salvation. See, in this verse here, he's talking about he wants to form an obedient people. He's giving them the reassurance that no matter what happens in life, he is there. He's present. He's in the midst of their lives. He created the nation and redeemed them from Babylon. He would continue to protect them through all of the trials that they went through, knowing that they could cope with all these new situations, all these new enemies that they were going to face on the way to the promised land. The people who had threatened their very existence, even to this day, they still have that assurance. The confident people of God give glory and praise to God then as a result of all the things that he does for them. <clears throat> So he guides us through the trials of life to find rest in him with the promise of salvation. For I am your Savior, the Holy One of Israel, your God. God is guaranteeing that a believer is not immune to the things in life, but we are going to experience those pain and those trials and those sufferings, and that grows us in our character. But he protects us. He protects us so that we can endure those trials. And if you've ever experienced this, these things in life, you're going to find out that we go through these trials at a time in our life so that we can edify someone else later on in our life who's going through these trials. We can lift them up. We can say, hey, I've been there. I've done that. I know what you're going through. I'm here for you. So we can edify that other person and lift them up through those trials and endure those trials. So as we go through and as we journey, as, as the Israelites were journeying through to the promised land and God was giving them these assurances, we as disciples of Christ, then we are on our own journey. And so today's message is on the journey of the disciples. And as we watch the chosen season four, we're talking about this. And, and I chose kind of an ominous background for this today because everything is not sunshine and roses and and you know, lollipops and things like that. You're going to have stuff you got to go through. But God gives us that assurance that in the midst of the stuff, he's right there with us. And as God's people, what God is calling us to do is we have to be there for each other and to lift each other up and to edify each other and to be there for each other. That's what we are as a godly people. So when God says, I have called you by name, and you are mine. God's words for the people of Israel, his chosen people by extension, see, that is us today. That's us today. 
those words left off the page of me on that Bible 38 years ago. It's been 38 years since then. I was being called by God to be a disciple. And did I answer that call right away? Well, kind of, you know, in a way. I was a little lukewarm at first, but as I grew in the scriptures, God kept prompting me, and it became more and more of the commitment then that God wanted me to make. And we were talking about baptism this morning in here before church began, and we were talking about the different types of, of baptism that, that you know, is done in the, in the world today. And baptism is not how it happens, but why it happens. It's that commitment that you're making to God. And that God is then ceremoniously washing you clean of the person that you used to be. Washing all away all that old stuff. Washing away that sin. And bringing into you a new life in Christ, giving you that redemption, that salvation, that restoration that you need. So it doesn't matter how you get baptized, but it matters that you do get baptized. Baptized by water and the Spirit, as it says in the scriptures. So that's what I was doing. I was going through that commitment process that God wanted me to make. Oh yeah, I went to church when I was young. You know, I went to Sunday school, to vacation, Bible school, and all that fun stuff. Even went to church camp a couple of times. I uh, got my toes wet, but never, you know, took the plunge, so to speak. In other words, I had the swimming lessons, but I wasn't ready to join the swim team. So what about you? When did God first call you? So what I'd like you to do today is you can do it silently if you'd like. But as you're sitting here today, I have called you, insert your name here as it says on the screen, I have called you by name and you are mine. So if you insert your name into that phrase, that calling from God, I have called you Steve by name and you are mine. But what do you feel now? You're invited into a personal relationship at that point. It becomes more than just words on a page. It becomes a personal invitation to join with God. Now God has the back part of that commitment. He says, what are you going to do now? What are you going to do now? See, God promised that he would never forsake us. He wasn't going to leave us in the times of trial, in the times of difficulty. He extends grace and mercy to us each and every day, regardless if we make that commitment to him or not. The Lord loves us so much, he explicitly said that we are his. So that should give you the hope. It should give you the inspiration to make that commitment. See, and that should set your heart on fire. Just like those, those uh, disciples that were walking to Damascus, and Jesus joined them on the road, but he hid his appearance from them. And as they spoke, he, he opened the scriptures to them so that they could be revealed unto them, so they would understand them. And as they did, their hearts seemed like they were on fire. That was the Holy Spirit coming into them and revealing God's will to them. So as we enter into this time uh, in the chosen season four, I think that's really where we find the disciples. They're, they're, they're in there. They, they got their toes wet, so to speak. Some were fishermen, so they're used to that. Um, they're in the midst of the swim lessons, but not sure about the swim team, so to speak. I'm using some metaphors today. So. As they follow Jesus, they see it might be rough waters at times. They see opposition from the Romans. They, they find opposition from the Jewish leadership, the high priests and the prophets. And as they journey with Jesus, they see Jesus face oppression even from his own people in his own town. He was rejected. But see, that assurance still stood. 600 years before Jesus came on the face of the earth, the prophet Isaiah wrote this verse. When you go through deep waters and great troubles, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers of difficulties, you will not drown. And when you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. Here, see, here God reveals through Isaiah what to expect as a follower 
as a disciple, as a person of God. God doesn't say he's going to keep us from the waters. He's not going to keep us from the rivers of difficulty. He doesn't say that we won't endure that fire of oppression, but he says we won't drown. He'll be with us. We won't be consumed. We won't be burned up. So he didn't say if, he said when. When you go through these things, I will be with you. I will protect you because I have chosen you. You are a chosen people. I have called you by name and you are mine. See, we became more at that point in time when we accept what God is offering to us in that verse. We become more than just a person walking on the face of the earth. We become a member of the family of God. And he is protecting us as that member of that family, as a disciple, as we join together in that learning, that teaching experience as we go through life. We are learning what it means to be a person of God, a family member of God. And he's not leaving us alone. He's joining with us. He's joining. Each of the followers of Jesus, as we watch, has uh, you know, some kind of baggage that they have in their lives, as each and every one of us do. We, we all have baggage of some kind that we're carrying through life. See, the disciples, they weren't all saints. They weren't living lives of piety. You know, One was a gambler. One had demons and lived a life of ill repute. One was an assassin. One was a tax collector. One made a living cheating people out of their properties. Some had issues of pride. But see, the point is, he took them out of that trap of sin that they were living in each and every day of their lives, and instead, he turned them into a life dedicated to God. He brought them into that family of God. He took them out of those waters. He took them out of the fires that they were living in each and every day, the trap of sin that they had, and he brought them into the family of God. So imagine that, the God of heaven, the God that created the internal, the entire universe, he calls us by name. But see, this scripture goes on to say that he ransomed us. And to know someone by name means that you have to have a personal relationship with that person. And we were talking about that on the two people who were on the cross on each side of Jesus. One of them completely, he just didn't care about Jesus whatsoever. Didn't care who he was, what he does. He says, oh, you know, you're no good anyway either. That's why you're up on the cross too. But the other one, what did he do? He called Jesus by name. He says, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. Well, you don't call someone by their first name unless you know that person. So he had to know Jesus. What else did he say? He said, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. He knew who Jesus was. He knew what he was capable of. He knew what he could do. So he called out to Jesus in faith. Now, nothing in the Bible tells us that he didn't get baptized way ahead of time. And maybe, as I was telling Doug this morning, maybe he shoved a Roman. Well, that was good enough for a death sentence back in those days. That may be why he ended up being crucified. Some of the scriptures call him robbers. Some of them call him thieves. We don't know. There's no backstory on him. But by what he said, we know that he knew who Jesus was. Which means he must have met him personally. Because he knew what Jesus could do. And he had faith enough to say... Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what did Jesus say? Truly I tell you today that you will join me in paradise. See, God desires that close relationship with us. We need that close relationship with him. He desires that with us, but we need that close relationship with him. When we com be completely dependent upon God, then we have fulfilled in part our reason to be on this earth to start with. Why he created us. 
A lot of people go through their whole lives searching for the reason or why they're here. Well, here's part of it right here. God created us so that we could have a relationship with him, so that we could bring honor and glory from our lives and living our lives out, bring honor and glory to God. That's the primary part of our reason for being here. But what else does he say here? He says, if we become completely dependent on him, then we fulfill our part, part of our reason for being here on earth. He says he ransomed us. And he ransom means that we were beholding or belonging to someone else. Well, who do you think that was? If they were living lives of sin, gamblers, prostitutes, demon-possessed, people who cheated them, others out of their properties? Who do you think they were beholden to? Well, just from my descriptions, they were trapped in a life of sin, beholding to the prince of darkness. And for that reason, in that season, then Jesus called them out of the life that they were living, some were existing just simply day to day, not really living out life that they had been created to live. Early on in my life, I learned about how a tree grows through seasons. And we go through all kinds of different seasons in our lives. How these seasons leave a mark as they progress through the seasons of your life. And you can see the good times and the bad times in those marks that they leave. They're called rings in a tree. Sometimes the rings are very close together, meaning it was a very dry season for that tree. And it wasn't able to grow much. And then if you see a wet group season there, you can see then you have a very thick growth ring. See, even a tree goes through different seasons in its life. So I can compare myself to a tree, and as the tree grows through the years, it leaves those same rings. It leaves growth in me. It leaves marks on my life. Not just my name. But it leaves marks on my life. Can I have humor? Scientists can determine a number of things about trees based on their rings and if they've had good or bad weather, whether they've been through a fire, or whether they had scars cut into the side of them from an incident that they had in our lives. Sound familiar? How many of us have scars that are visible reminders of something we've been through in our lives? Yeah, all of us. See? Never said that we weren't going to go through those waters of difficulty. Weren't going to go through that fire of repression. It leaves a mark. It leaves a scar. It's what we do with that as we progress through our lives that makes a difference. Sometimes we learn quickly. Other times we might spend an entire season trying to get the message through our heads. Regardless, God is always there with us and will never forsake us. Being a disciple is a life long learning experience. It isn't one day you accept God and then everything's there. It doesn't appear like magic. It's a lifelong learning experience. And what do the scriptures tell us? It, it tells us that God will reveal the mysteries to us as we become deeper in the relationship with him as we learn the scriptures. And so that's what the seasons are all about are learning opportunities to disciple God's meaning for our lives. So as we watch this season of The Chosen, I want you to really think about this, because each one of those people on screen is a lot like us going through trials. Each is in their own season, building their life experiences together, however, as a group. As a group. But they're together, but they're living each one of these things out separately. And that's just like us here, just like Grace Street Church. We're here, we lift each other up, we, we share our experiences throughout the weeks with each other. Fellowship together gives us that opportunity to gather together as God's family and to experience the things that God wants us to experience. Because we can say, hey, I went through this bad thing this week, but guess what? I had this God incident that happened. And we get to share those with one another, and that kind of takes another person and goes, oh, yeah. Yeah, I had this happen, and this happened, and this happened. It makes us 
reveal then the things that God has done in our life for that last week. It's part of the fellowship experience that we get only when we can gather together in, in his name. As disciples, we're brought together by God to be here together just like the disciples back then. We we're here to edify each other. I use that term edification a lot, but there's so much meaning to it. See, we lift each other up, we give each other a hand up, not a hand out, a hand up to bring us through the experiences of life, to get us through those rivers of difficulty. Some of us are lifeguards. We're here to bring that person through. God uses us, that's part of your process of life. God says, okay, I'm gonna use Denny to lift you up by bringing us a rock in there with a picture on it. Wow, that meant a lot, thank you. Sorry. It's been a year. So dad's picture's on the rock back there. So I lost my dad a year ago, this last Wednesday. And so I looked at that this morning. That was on purpose. That's dad. Oh, thank you, Daddy. So sorry about that. So we each live our own lives. We each have our own personal trials. But we come together as a family. United by God to do his work, to bring us through those trials, to do good for other people, to lift them up at a time when they're hurting. Sound familiar? It's how we come together. It's how we live together, how we grow together. That exemplifies what God is calling is for our lives and our purpose for our lives. How we do those things as we come together. It's no mistake that we were brought together here. We were put here not to be an island to ourselves, but to be much more than that. We were called to be a river flowing out into the world to spread God's word, God's love, and the messages of hope and salvation to a very broken world. To a very broken world using a lot of metaphors here today. Okay, had enough of those metaphors? Well, maybe one more. As we progress through with the disciples, we are see teachings from Jesus that is quite a different departure from the early lessons that they learned in the, in the tabernacles and in, in the instructions that they had in the temple. These lessons that they're learning here are completely different, are a departure from what they had learned before. And in doing so, they're swimmers on the way to becoming lifeguards. What's the function of a lifeguard? Well, I was a lifeguard back when I was a teenager. And one of the first things they said is, the only reason you're here is not to look good sitting up here on that stool. You're there to save someone's life should they get in trouble. Should they get in trouble? Should they go through the waters and start to drown, you're there to lift them up out of the water, resuscitate them, and save their life. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, it really fits perfectly in here. Some have adapted quickly to the journey, and some were still hesitant to commit fully as we look at the disciples. It's a lot like us in church. We're in different seasons of growth, and yet we give the helping hand up to others just starting the journey because you know what their journey is going to be like, and you want to help them along the way. As a pastor, I can really appreciate seeing this because it means that we're doing what God called us to do, to be the family of God, not name only. God wants us to be there for each other. He wants us to be the family of God. There's a big difference there. There's a lot of times in, in a, a lot of the churches that I've been to before, um, they all attend a church and they come in on a Sunday and they go. But they're not being a family. I was talking to someone recently that goes to one of the larger churches here, and they said, you know, 
we just don't feel like we really belong. It's, we go there, and they have a great message. They've got a good pastor. I, I know, he's a good pastor. I know him. But they don't, there's no family there. They don't feel like they belong. They don't feel like they could go and talk to someone about the problems that they're having in their lives. But see, that's not a church. That's not a church. A church is a family of believers coming together to edify each other, to lift each other up, and to carry them through the problems that they're having in their lives. That is the purpose of our lives. That's why God put us here. If you're searching for that purpose, there it is. There it is. We are to be here as God's people for God's people. But more than that, God created all the people. So we have to be there for everyone. We don't have to agree with them. We need to pray for them. We need to approach them in love, in grace, and mercy. The same thing that God pr provides to us. Grace, mercy, and love. Pray them through their situations. Huh. So, as we take a look at different things and different personalities and going through different things in churches, um, the family's made up of a lot of different people. I remember growing up and having to sit there because my dad was on the council of the church. We had to sit through through these Meetings that, as a kid, I'm sure lasted at least a week uh, on, on a Sunday afternoon as they were discussing what color the carpet should be for the church. Now, you'd think that they could resolve that, you know, fairly quickly. Six months later, you know, a church committee finally resolves uh, and comes to a consensus. See, being a family of God and, and being a church doesn't mean we're going to always agree on everything and it's not going to be like everything's going to be simple and, and easy. And there's a whole series of compromises. There's a whole series of things that need to be discussed out. But if you come to a compromise and everything, you won't have division. Sometimes it leads to lively discussions. And even so, uh, they remain united together, then you're doing the work of God. I've seen this in the past where it's caused major rifts in churches and even caused splits between members, mostly not caused by ministry <clears throat> ideology issues, per se, but really, when we look at it, from petty things. The color and type of carpet, the choir robes, the new hymnals, who was elected to what position in the church for some reason, became so polarizing, they split the churches involved and ended long-term relationships. See, they focused on the wrong thing. A split like that, a rift in the church, a breakup of the family of God can only happen if we are focused away from what truly mattered to something of material means instead. We see that in Peter as he steps out of the boat in the midst of the storm and he starts coming to Jesus and as long as he keeps his eyes focused on Jesus, he's great but as soon as he keeps his focus off, lets his focus off of Jesus he immediately starts to drown there's a lot more to that story than what most people gather that's our example for life so if we don't want to drown in the storms of life, in the problems and in the troubles of life, God says, keep your focus on me, and I'll bring you through the storm. I'll bring you through the storm. It goes back to our opening verse today. He promises that he's not going to let us drown if we keep our focus on him. But when we focus on petty stuff, stuff that really doesn't matter, when we lose our focus, we lose God in the process. When we lose God in the process, trouble is bound to ensue. So we're going to see some of that here in episode two. We see an escalation in the opposition and persecution as we see Jesus being more bold and more focused on his mission and what was yet to come in his ministry. 
It is also when we see tensions between disciples start to flare up as Jesus declares Simon, now Peter, or Cephas, because uh, he renamed him Cephas, which means stone. And he says, on, on the stone, on this rock, I will build my church. And that didn't sit well with some of the other disciples. See, they thought they were supposed to be the sons of, the sons of thunder. If you remember those, James and John, you know, the, the sons of thunder, they, they were out there, they were big, bold, and they were going to take charge. You know, when can we take charge? When can we take charge? And Jesus, in the right time. In the right time. Human nature is to react why them and not me? Why them? Someone got something that I didn't get. Why them, not me? Because they're in a different season than what you are. We have to understand that. Simon Peter, Cephas, was in a different season than what some of the other disciples were. Why he had been tested again and again and again. Jesus was preparing him to be the leader he needed to be by giving him those trials in his life. See, we got to go all the way back to season one and we got to progress our way through to season four and we see all of those trials that Jesus put him through. Did he put the rest of the disciples through those trials? No. He was building him up for his season to be in charge, to build that church build that rock I have called you by name you are mine when you pass through those waters you will not drown when you pass through the fire of oppression you will not be consumed you will not burn up it was his time and it was his season and I'm sure you know what was going on in the minds of the other disciples Simon Peter was the first one called, so it could stand to be reason that he was chosen just simply from that human perspective. But Jesus, see, he knew each one of their hearts. He knew their strengths. He knew their weaknesses. He had prepared Simon Peter to come out of the person that he used to be, a gambler, a cheat, and build a church on him because he had put him through some of the seasons and had tempted, tempered his character in the process to where he thought he is now ready to be a leader of people in my church and to keep his focus on God. He learned a good lesson, sinking in the sea. See, Simon Peter, he was a regular guy. He wasn't particularly intelligent or amazing at anything. He was humble, and he was a fisherman. There is nothing special nor out, outstanding about Peter at all. And that's probably why Jesus chose him to be one of his apostles. Peter was humble. Any of us can be Peter. Peter liked Jesus because despite of his fault flaws, despite of what he was put through in those seasons, he still retained his faith in Jesus. Despite the flaws, despite the things he had been through. He retained his faith in Jesus. He trusted Jesus. Sure, Peter even had doubts. When his life was threatened, Peter denied Christ three times after his arrest. That's most likely is when we would have done that same thing too. We're all Peters at times in our lives. All of them had flaws. All of the disciples had flaws, and yet they were called by Jesus because he saw their hearts. They were ordinary men who were reluctant to do what the Lord commanded them to do. Sounds really familiar. <laughs> Let's go all the way back. Moses stuttered. He wasn't a natural public speaker, yet he was called to be the voice of God for a people to bring them out of oppression. He was called to be the voice of God to these people, to bring them out of oppression, to lead these people through. He was a murderer. But God still used him. He brought him through the seasons. He tested his faith. He retained his faith 
and God used it. Look, the reason why God chooses individuals like these is because it's clear to anybody who reads the scriptures that their power and ability originated from God and not from themselves. We have to look at these things and understand these stories are told so that we could understand that we are an ordinary people that God can use to do extraordinary things through him, not from ourselves, not from our own empowerment, but through the empowerment of God. It wasn't because of their personality that they achieved greatness. It was God who achieved greatness through them. To God be the glory. He does these things so that we can bring glory and honor to God in doing the things that God has asked us to do. So we can insert ourselves into Peter. We're all like Peter, filled with insecurities, doubts, anxieties, fears. Even today, we're unsure of ourselves. Even through all the things that we've been through, we doubt our faith at times. And even doubt if God hears us and hears our cries. How many times do we go through a season of dryness with God? Do you know why? It's because when we go through that season and we're crying out to God, we are then surrendering ourselves to him and declaring to God, I need you. I can't get through this on my own. And that's what he's waiting for. Taking our focus off of the situation or circumstance that we're going through and putting our focus completely on God. Completely on God. Committing ourselves to God. We need to remain resolute in our faith despite the issues, despite the circumstances we're going through. Our faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior makes us eternally saved that we should give that reassurance to retain our faith. Let me read that again. Our faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior makes us eternally saved so we should give us reassurance to retain our faith in the midst of of the season of life that we're going through. When we look to the other disciples, each one of them brought something unique to the group as a whole. See, God brought them together for a reason. And see, if you look around the room in here, we know the people online who are watching us here today, we know that we're all in each individuals, but God brings us together so that we can use the talents that God has given us, each one of us individually, to work for the betterment of the family of God. God uses these things to do the work of the collective. Now, no, I'm not talking about Star Trek. I know I've been posting up some Star Trek funnies. Bad dad jokes on Saturdays. Those are S-A-D-D-U-R-D-A-Y, Saturdays. <laughs> I'm talking about the pooling of the strengths and resources for the furtherment of the mission of God. Kind of like Star Trek, but different. See, each one of us was called because of our differences in our abilities. Each one of us has a different background. But see, we all have the same calling. We all have the same calling. It wouldn't work if we were all the same person. We have to be individuals because we have different talents that God has given each one of us individually to come together as a collective, to do the collective work of God. Each to their own, they would not be able to have done the work that Jesus was calling them to do. But together they did what needed to be done. And that was true of each one of them that they called. Paul was uniquely qualified to go to the Romans because he was known and respected there in that sphere. He was also known and respected by the Jewish council. And they didn't come against him because he could testify to the people in a unique manner to reach an audience that others couldn't hope for. He started off his, his time persecuting Christians unto death. And yet God called him. God called him to mission. Look what he did with Paul. Paul went on to write over half of the New Testament. The Testament to God. A New Testament to God. So each one of the apostles were unique in their outreach abilities. Same as we are here. 
same as we are here. If we were all the same, we wouldn't get the same job done that God needs us to do. The question is, are you reaching out? Are you spreading the word of God to the best of your abilities? Are you spreading the word about our church and our programs to the best of your ability? If not, why not? See, it's not for me. It's for God. It's for God. I know that seems very pointed, and it may get some people upset. But the point here is, are we really being an effective disciple for God and of God to the people that we need to reach? He put a mission on our lives. Are we doing what we need to do? Are we doing what God is calling us to do? I didn't do it for a while. I had a different agenda. I wanted to go and do these things. And God kept going, no, no, no. Now, trust me, when he calls you and says, time to start your mission, boy, he gets your attention quick. And sometimes it's not pleasant. Sometimes it's not pleasant. But he got my attention. And I made a change in my life. And it was changed for the better. So I'm going to switch gears here. We're going to talk about the Apostle John for a moment. See, John was special in that he out-survived all of the other apostles. He was imprisoned on the island of Patmos for a reason. See, they, they tried to kill John, and they poisoned him. But he survived the poisoning. So they said he must have the hand of God on him. So they sent him to the island of Patmos. What happened on the island of Patmos? Well, John wrote five, five different books. The most important of those being the revelation of Jesus Christ in the final book of the Bible. Jesus wouldn't tell him what the plan was. Some of the apostles knew that Jesus had special plans for John. He said, this is a disciple whom I love. He had a special calling for John. See, John wasn't Cephas. Remember that? Who got upset when Peter was called? John. Well, Jesus loves me. He told me he loves me. How come I'm not the leader? Because he had a different plan for Peter and John's lives. He had a different purpose for each one. And we have to realize that ourselves. We're not all called to the same calling. But we are all called. I want you to hang on to that one. We're not all called to the same purpose. We are all called. So John was imprisoned on the island of Patmos. Now, if you don't know anything about the island of Patmos, is it's a very, very, very hot, arid, dry place in the middle of the sea. Not much grows there. It's hard to survive there. He would have had to rely on God completely for his existence day to day. Surrounded by salt water. What happens when you drink salt water? It dehydrates you. So he had to provide fresh water for him. He had to provide food for him. He had to provide shelter for him from the storms. He was on a very deserted island. Most people don't understand that. But if you read the entire story, it's, it's quite telling what John had to go through to be chosen by God. He didn't let him drown. Didn't let him burn up. He provided for his existence so he could write what needed to be written in one of the most important books of the Bible. See, it's an important and critical book of the Holy Bible which provides the details about the end time. Not a shock and awe in the sense of things, but in a message of hope and restoration that it tells. For those of faith, it's a blessing. For those not of the faith, it's an ominous future that I hope they're ready to face. If they turn away from God. But see, it's our story too because we have to tell that same story because it is a hope, story of hope. It's a story of restoration. We know who wins in the end. And we want to bring those people along with us that we care about even though they may be deaf to hearing the message right now. Right now, everyone in their own 
season. Why does it take so long for God to get up? He says, I want my people there. He's preordained that. See, we are like the apostles when they were then. As we're called to go and do God's work here on earth, regardless of how you view yourself as ready to go, you are still called to go and called to do. More than that, you're called to believe it. And believe it or not, you're equipped to go just as you are today to the best of your ability. The disciples didn't feel as they were adequately prepared the first time Jesus sent them out, but they went out and did good works in his name. In his name. Remember what I said before? What did I say before? We're all called to do. As long as we keep our focus on God, he will equip us, he will empower us to be able to do his works in his name. We have to take the challenge off of ourselves first. So I challenge each of us this week to reach out to five people and invite them to church to invite them to know more about Jesus. And that's either in person or on your social media. Invite them to explore Grace Street Church. See, we have a difference of programs in here, so it will reach out to different people. Racetracks, movies, our study nights, the things that we study in here. We bring those in so it speaks to people differently each time. Nobody hears the same message at the time it's given. Some people may not like hearing me preach, but they might listen to the music that we have because there's a message in that music as well. And we choose that to fit alongside the message that's given that day. And if they've ever heard Denise pray, it's a great thing because we see God at work in it. I prefer the message. She has no <coughs> idea what's going to be said more times, times than not. Her prayers that she's lifting up and edifying people in that day are parts of the message that I just got done giving. God is good. It's not me. It's God at work in our lives and in our church. So it might be the first step that those people need who have never heard the word to be able to come in and fill the seat next to you or to join us online. Let us pray. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we just praise you and and thank you for this day, for this message, for this opportunity to gather and grow here in your name. Lord, we thank you for the calling that you put on each and every one of our lives. We thank you for the many, many, many blessings that you give us each and every day. We ask that you would open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to envelop this message and to live it out each and every day of our lives. Let us respond to your calling out of gladness of heart, out of a sense of responsibility, and yet in the midst of all that, knowing that you are there along with us no matter what we are going through. We praise you and thank you for all these things. In your precious and holy name we pray today. Amen. Amen. Usually you get a break at this point in time and Terry will come up and he'll do communion, but you kind of stuck with me start to finish today. Hopefully it's not bad. As we come into our time of communion this morning, as, as we had this message on our calling from God, as we had this reminder of the salvation that he had for us, of, as the love that he has for us. None of this is in the past tense because his love is alive and surviving today. Just as has been since the beginning of time. Since the beginning of time. I've said it many, many times as we come into this time of communion, it's a time for us to remember. It's a time for us to remember that it was love that held Jesus to the cross. Not the ropes, not the spikes, but love. Love brought him to the cross. Love held him to the cross. Love kept him on the cross for us so that we could have that opportunity for that salvation that opportunity to gather together as the family of God with God for eternity for eternity 
And so as we come into our time of, of communion today, I want you to remember that sacrifice that was made for us. That eternal love. That sacrificial love. Agape love. As we learned from the Greek several months back. That agape love is given without any kind of strings attached. All we have to do is accept it. All we have to do is accept it. And God promises through us and through his messages in here that he will never leave us or forsake us. As we heard in Isaiah, how many times in the scriptures does he tell us that? I think I did the count on that one time. It's over 367 times that he will never leave us or forsake us. Think about that. It's almost like one for each every day of the year. It's the reminder we need. So we are called to a period of remembrance as we take communion today. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat to join with him. Later on in the meal, he took a cup and he blessed it. He filled it and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. And as we do that, we are called to participate. Participation means that we are not an idle activity, but we are there to be active in that salvation. We are called to be active in that remembrance of the sacrifice that Jesus made. That means that we need to tell others about that sacrifice that is made for them as well. It wasn't made just for us. The body of Christ broken for you. Take. Blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Thanks be to God. And good morning. Good morning. It's great to see everybody this morning. So now it's time for prayers for the people. And if you have any prayers you'd like lifted up, I would gladly do that this morning. have a few so <laughs> we'll continue and father just let the holy spirit come and rest in this house as i pray for these people lord father god we thank you that you have given us another day to praise and honor your holy name we thank you for life and breath we thank you for vision in a dark world we thank you for friends and family as in psalms 19 8 through 10 the precepts of the lord are right giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to your eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. Father God, I ask that you help us to be people that follow your word and do as it says, as in Psalms 19, 13, 14. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over us, then will I be blameless, innocent of great transgressions. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Father God, we lift up all who have had surgeries in this past couple weeks. We praise you that you have given doctors and surgeons the wisdom to know how to surgically fix the human body. We praise you that you send your Holy Spirit to be in these surgery rooms to guide and direct their minds and hands. That is why it is so important that we pray for each other before we go through things in life, to know full well that your hand will be upon us during these trials. We ask that you will continue to heal their bodies and to give each person the care they need to heal correctly and quickly. Father, to all online and here who are suffering ailments of all kinds, cancer, COVID, and mental illness, with your unfailing love and for your name's sake, preserve their lives. In your righteousness and mercies, bring them out of their troubles. Guide them all to you so they may praise your holy name and thank you for your healing power that, that is upon them. 
Thank you, Jesus, for your love for all mankind. And Father God, please walk with our children and grandchildren. Lead them on level ground that leads them back to you. When they have troubles in this life, put Christian people in their path. Put a hedge of protection around them. Never let go. And we thank you for what you are doing in their lives. Father God, please walk among our homeless. Give them a willing heart and mind to find a way out of their current situations. In the duration of their homelessness, guide them always back to you. And Father God, hold on to America. Turn our hearts back to you. Help us to repent of things that do not line up with your word. Let America revere you as our God once again. Please do not turn away from us, Lord Jesus. Help us to stand for the people that have lost their lives to give us our freedoms. We need you in our lives, Father God, in our schools and in our churches, in everyone's hearts and minds. Help us to worship you as you are, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Prince of Peace, and King of the Universe. Thank you, Jesus, for your love for us. Thank you, Denise. I bring us to the end of our online portion of our service today. Uh, we thank you guys for joining with us in here. Um, we had some new guests in from Texas last week, and, and that was kind of fun uh, to be able to share our message with them as well. Um, so our message goes way outside of just the bounds of Cedar Rapids here, and uh, we thank God for allowing us to be able to do that. Uh, let us join together in prayer, shall we? Lord God, we come before you today with a humbleness of heart. We've all messed up at some point in our lives, and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. But you assure us that that's not where we have to stay, lost in a lost world. Lord, we thank you for your grace and for your mercy. We thank you for your unending love and your forgiveness. We ask that you would help us to be strong in you, strong in our faith that keeps us from falling and brings us into your glory. Restore us, reconcile us, redeem us today. Lord Jesus, we praise and we thank you and pray this in your holy name.